Good afternoon and welcome everybody to this beautiful Sunday sunset safari. My name is James Henry, Brian is on camera and you are watching Safari Live. It's a very balmy sort of 30 degrees Celsius apparently today, that's 86 degrees Fahrenheit. It is still the middle of August, which means we're in the middle of winter. Um, not very wintry temperatures at all, hopefully harbingers of a great deluge to follow. With me, of course, well, with Brian and I, of course, the thumb. Brian, the thumb is what today? A tumbleweed. A tumbleweed, very nice, Brian. Look at it tumbling away in the hotness of the midwinter's dry day. Over there, there is Anyala. He's having a nice drink, a Sunday drink after his Sunday lunch. What do you think he had for lunch, Brian? Ooh, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Some roast chicken, perhaps? Mm, quite the buffet, I think. Yes, I probably, and apple crumble, of course. One must have apple crumble with ice cream on a hot day like this on Sunday afternoon. Now, you are on a live safari, as I mentioned. If you're wondering how it is that you've come across this stream and what it is you're watching and who this buffoon talking to you is, you are on a live safari. So please do talk to us, hashtag safari live, questions at wildearth.tv, the former on Twitter, the latter on the email. There is a Nyala there, that's the one you're looking at, but in this tree to the left of us, I've just spotted a monkey. Brian, there's a monkey there. It's, well, it's sort of on the left. There are probably quite a few monkeys in the tree, everybody. This is a jackaberry tree, and it's a really good place to come and look for animals because they are enjoying the fruits. Let me go forward a little bit, and I'll tell you that on the other vehicle we have Jamie Patterson. Have you got a monkey there, Brian? I'll go a bit forward. Jamie Patterson is being filmed by the diminutive and heavily bearded Viem Durenbrach, and in the final control, Kirsten, Mc yeah, right above us. Kirsten McLennan Smith. That's not Kirsten. That's a monkey, everybody. And I think she is being ably assisted by Geraldine, the cheesecake Kent. Isn't that a wonderful shot of that monkey? I tried to take a picture of a monkey two days ago, everyone, and I failed dismally. Not because uh, uh, there was anything wrong with the monkey, but because I am just too slow with my camera. This light, of course, beastly harsh, so unlikely to produce me an award winner, but we'll see. I got him, Brian. Did you? Yeah. Well done, James. Thank you so much. Isn't that nice? They're such good value to watch these chaps. Monkey, where are you going? Stay there. I guess he's having jackalberries for Sunday lunch. No apple crumble and ice cream for him. No, Nyala, finished it all. Nyala finished all the apple crumble and ice cream, yes, correct. I'm rather hoping these things will become a little riper fairly soon. There are quite a few on the ground there. I might go and actually sample one. Hang on a sec, everyone. They've been pretty dull up till now. Pretty uh, tasteless and bitter. Well, let's see how the monkeys react. They won't like the fact that I'm under the car or under the tree that they're in. But they can't really go anywhere, you see. There are lots of them up here. I can just see them standing underneath them. Now, ideally, if I was to approach the tree, they'd like to jump into another tree. Because they don't know that I'm an incapable human being and I'm incapable of climbing trees anything like as fast as they are. So they're a little bit threatened up there because they've got nowhere to go. And so they'll watch me quite carefully, which is what they're doing now. See if I can find a ripe fruit for you to sample, everyone. Mostly just skins, though, on the ground here, where the monkeys have been dropping them. So they peel them off in the same way that you and I would, and then they drop them at the peels on the ground. No, there are no fruits. They're very carefully being dropped, just the pips. Oh, here we go. 
Here's one. I'm just going to get No, they're not ready yet. Ooh, that's horrible. No, they're not ready yet, I'm afraid. Righty. We're going to go to Cheetah Plains now, see if we can follow up on the Styx cubs. Um, they were there apparently this morning with the lionesses from the Styx Pride. Uh, VM has very disconcertingly called them um, the street children. Oh, hang on. There's a female leopard at Treehouse Dam. I think we should go straight there. We're right nearby. Just go again with that, confirm, at Treehouse Dam. A affirmative. This is very exciting. It's just come through now on the wire. Karula. Okay, copy, thanks. We'll try and make our way there. We're just on elephant carcass. Okay, everybody, let's go and see if we can't have a quick look at Karula before we go to the... <laughs> okay, and let's go across to Jamie and get an introduction from her. There are also lions on Juma. We might well not go to Cheetah Plains. Let's get an introduction from Jamie. I'll find out what's going here. Copy, thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. And you've caught us just as we are attempting to reposition, reposition to show you something wonderful. Look who is here having his afternoon lunch. Having spoken about what the Inyala had for lunch, while well, Mr. Tingana is having something else, a little bit more meat-based, I imagine. I have absolutely no idea what it is that he has found, but he has definitely managed to find something. Hello, lovely boy. Now, this is exactly where he was left this morning by the Arethusa guides, which means he's probably been lying up here, which also means that whatever he managed to catch stumbled into him rather than him actively hunting it. And it's also most likely something small, given the fact that he has now finished it all off. Hello beautiful boy. So exciting stuff. Karula reported a treehouse dam. Tingana resting in the shade of a Tamburti thicket and Vim and myself perched precariously on the side of a termite mound. Not the easiest spot to get into. <laughs> Good afternoon by the way. My name is Jamie and I have Vim on camera with me. And we've managed to relocate him. We actually followed the sound of his crunching I'm going to try and just go forward ever so slightly. Let's see if he will let me. Oh, a lovely start for this afternoon, given that this morning... Hello, tree. Is that going to be in your way, Viam? No. There we go. Given that... Oh, there we go. <laughs> Viam's now wearing it on his head. <laughs> this morning, we spent the morning in a rather fruitless search for the Inkohumas, they led us in circles and I tracked a mating leopard pair, Mvula and his lovely lady friend, off the property and onto Buffel's Hook. But we started off, the, or Brent started off the morning with Tingano walking ahead of him. This morning he was sawing away. What have you got there? I, my first thought was that he'd caught something like a scrub hair, but that bone is too long. That bone, no, that definitely wasn't. Perhaps something like a steenbok or a daker, which for a leopard of Tingana's size would most likely be an afternoon snack. And he's finished it all off completely, I suppose. Works up quite an appetite wandering through one's territorial area rasping away in that sawing sound that leopards do. He is absolutely massive. I always feel that every time I see Tingana there's a little part of me that still is surprised at how huge his neck is. 
And I think this morning he actually scared Mvula off Juma with all of his rasping calls. He was announcing that he is the dominant one in that area. And Mvula, who looked making a beeline for Juma and actually went on to Juma for a little bit, then judging by his tracks, scampered off at quite a rapid pace into Buffel's Hook next to Tambuerti Dam. And I'm hoping that this afternoon they will decide to come back because we'll have limited time to spend with Tingana in this particular spot. We are on Arethusa and there'll be lots of vehicles that will want to come and see him. And because of the position that he's in, it's probably only, to go, only going to fit in one or two vehicles. Oh, flies. Of course, Tingana is the dominant male leopard that we see most often around these parts, but there is another a little bit further to the west. Andrew, I'm afraid I haven't heard any news about the Anderson male recently. The Anderson male, I mean, he is starting on to, he's starting to sort of take on these mythical proportions in terms of stories from the Sabi Sands. He's rumored to be the biggest male leopard that the northern, at least the northern Sabi Sands has ever seen. But apparently some people say he's actually not that much bigger than Tingana, but he's probably got about 10 kilograms on him. And of course with male leopards it's not just about size, it's a little bit about attitude as well. But by all accounts, the Anderson male is a beast of a male leopard. Absolutely enormous. And his, the female that he mated with and his supposed daughter Tiani, I must say that if all accounts are true about Anderson Male, then she is certainly taking a, taking, what's the word? <laughs> I've gone blank. Where you share genetic qualities with some, taking after, there we go. Almost, taking after her supposed father in terms of some of the things she has accomplished before even being fully grown. The stories say she killed an adult impala at the age of ten, nine to ten months old. Others say she killed a Dacre when she was only just a couple of months old. Oh, Tingana's up. And he perhaps is reveling in his good fortune that some poor Steenbok or Dacre decided to come wandering in to where he is. Oh, wonderful. in front of the vehicle. Ah, a little bit of a urine spray, a territorial mark, and off he goes. What are your plans now, boy? My thoughts would be he's going to go and find a nice shady spot to lie down in. Probably right there. Yes, right there. And down he goes. Okay, let's try and get around to try and catch up with him. Yes, Ashley, absolutely, very, very good point. He could well have been eating a warthog, particularly, and I'm not going to make Liam show you because he's currently got a branch attached to the top of his camera, particularly since we're sitting right next to a termite mound that may well once have been the hiding place of a warthog that has since been caught by Tingana. Now, Tingana's got... A little bit of a refutation. Oops, no, that's forwards. We need to go backwards. He's got a little bit of a refutation as a very, very good, very capable of catching and going, going into animals' burrows and catching them from there. I'm just trying to work out how I got myself into this mess so that I can get myself out of it. I think I went this way. Well, oh, everybody, hold on. Watch out, Liam. There's a... Serious spike thorn that wants to get you. Very much wants to get you. There we go. Oh, no, there we don't go. Got an antenna. Almost. What was I talking about? Oh yes, Tingana. He definitely has a reputation for being 
an aardvark and warthog killer, and we've seen him on two separate occasions climb into warthog burrows and catch the warthogs in there. Once was live on one of our television specials with Peter Pretorius. The other was when James was on a walk on tracking team. And he managed to spot him there. So he's definitely earned that reputation. And leopards do specialize in that sort of thing. They, they have specialities. Some of them are natural tunnel raiders. Hope everybody's ducking. Here we go. Perfect. Aren't you beautiful? Licking away all the remains of his whatever it was kill. Very good point. I didn't think of Warthog, and it actually should have been the first thing that crossed my mind. He's found himself a patch of shade. I have to say this is an extremely warm day. Spring is definitely in the air, in the air. <coughs> and Monique in London is absolutely right. It does look like he's still got a little bit of a limp. Tingana's had this limp on and off almost since the entire time I've known him, but it got particularly bad when he was mating with a female leopard called Tundi, who is Karula's daughter, Shadow's sister. Probably, oh, I don't know, gosh, it must have been six months ago or something, somewhere around there. And from then, he's always had it, and it gets better, and it gets worse, and better, and worse. We don't know exactly what caused it. He did seem to have quite a nasty dew claw injury on that leg. But it comes and goes, and dominant male leopards often have a limp, or some kind of injury to them just from the general wear and tear of their everyday life, whether it's from hunting something or patrolling their territory and getting into a scrap with another leopard. And leopard fights are usually fast and furious and then over, just as, just as quickly as they started. Now we don't know what caused Tingana's injury. We know that we noticed it particularly badly after him he was mating with Tundi. But it's still not something that seems to be hampering him in any major fashion. The last time I saw Tingana properly was at Red Dam. And that was actually the worst condition I feel as though I've seen him in. He was very thin for Tingana. Tingana's always been muscular and I wouldn't call him chubby by any stretch of the imagination. But he's always been a very well-built leopard. And that particular day he looked hungry and very much smaller than I'd ever seen him looking with it, and his limp was very pronounced. But it seems to be a little bit better. I think it's just going to come and go. And it's probably the winter cold exacerbated it. You know, it kind of got stiff and sore as he moved throughout an area. But it does seem to be very much improved. What a lovely message from Fee Duffy, who is from South Africa originally, but has since left the country and is now feeling terribly homesick for the African bush. Well, Fee, this might be the next best thing. That w the only way we can really comfort you is to offer these live safari experiences for you every day, twice a day. And of course, no driver is ever the same. But Fee, I completely understand. I think for me, I mean, I lived in the UK. The longing for the African bush had me fleeing to all of the damn cameras almost constantly. I used to sit and study with my headphones on and listen to just the sounds of the African bush, even if I wasn't watching the damn camera the whole time. That, of course, was when I had internet that was capable of doing such things. But that's how I used to cope with my longing, my yearning for the African bush, but I really, really do understand completely. Doesn't he just look so happy with himself? He's got his shady spot, he's got a full belly. The flies are irritating him a little bit. But he's got a nice comfortable place to lie down.
And Andrew would like to know why other leopard subspecies do not possess the massive le bleh, massive necks that our leopards do. And Andrew, the only thing I can suggest is competition. Um, so the leopard, the male leopard, because we know that their dewlap and their massive necks are an adaption for being able to fight off other males and hoist kills into trees. Okay. Well, that was a surprise. Middle of the day, full belly, territorial rasping call. How awesome is that? What are you calling for, boy? What are you smelling? I have to tell you, leopards are so much fun, and Tingana particularly, because they do such unexpected things. I mean, it's 30 degrees today, this afternoon. It's boiling hot. I'm sweating. And there he is rasping in the middle of the day. Cats are meant to be fast asleep in the shade. And that's the exact opposite of what he's done. He's hunted. And actually, you know what, sorry. I think he did get a warthog. I think that's exactly what he got. Oh, and he's up. Sorry. He's up again. Sorry, Andrew. We'll get, we'll get back to your question in a moment. And he's down again. I was going to say, it can't possibly be that unpredictable. I spoke about it this morning, the fact that I once saw Tingana on a 40 degree day, settled in the shade of a tree, and then he got up and walked far that afternoon. It was a day that we had to start the sunset safari early, uh, late, because it was too hot. So Andrew, my guess would be competition. We've got some of the highest leopard concentrations, at least in South Africa in this particular area. So that in turn will mean that the leopards with the biggest necks in terms of protecting their vital parts of their necks, their spine, and just being generally stronger than other males, they'll be the ones that pass on their genetics. Whereas with something like Cape leopards, for example, the competition is, oh goodness, this is now much trickier. The competition is much reduced. The flies are irritating him. He could see the irritation written all over his face. So in Cape, the Cape leopard, which is slowly starting to be a recognized subspecies, first of all, there's a lot of literature to suggest that they are in fact a little bit inbred, which will immediately start to reduce their physical features. And secondly, there's not nearly as many, it's not nearly as high a concentration. Oh, catch them! Get them! <laughs> Get those irritating flies. This sort of reminds me of Connor at lunchtime. Yeah, Connor doesn't snap at the flies, just to clarify. But he does try and catch them. And Steph. Actually, even more like Steph. <laughs> I do have to share this with you, just talking of flies and Connor. Connor caught a fly in his hand, like something out of the Karate Kid. Not quite chopsticks, but with his hand. And then promptly threw it at Kirsty and nearly landed in her mouth. You've got to be tough out here. You never know when <laughs> attack is around the next corner. Kirsty handled it very well. Not the fly, that is, the situation. Anyway, moving on. That's why, I mean, the only reason I would say that the size difference is a big deal in this area is competition. It's why the northern Sabi sand leopard in general are smaller than the southern Sabi sand leopard. Because the territory here is not as coveted as it is further south. And of course, the leopards around rivers with huge vegetation, big, big trees. Huge vegetation, I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Enormous trees, big tambourtes, fig trees, jackalberries, and a high prey concentration will mean that competition is fiercer than it is here. Which is why territories for leopards are bigger here, and they're smaller in size. I mean, some of the females that I saw in the Kruger National Park next, next to the Lataba and the Early Fronts River were absolutely enormous. They were basically double Karula's size. Roger, he wants to know whether or not the male lions ever run the risk of running into a lion or attracting the attention of a lion when they're sawing at night. All leopards do. 
um, whether they're female or male. The difference is that leopards, once they reach a certain age, unless they are very, very distracted by something, the chances of them being caught and killed by a lion are infinitesimal. They are so, so small because they are faster than lions and they are more agile than lions and they'll be able to launch themselves up into trees. And although we've got this predator hierarchy and this, the desire of predators to remove competition, they actually don't, unless it's a male lion every now and again, they generally don't set out to hunt and catch each other on a regular basis. That's why we see leopards lying with hyenas. Um, you might even see leopards with hy and lions in the same sighting as long as the leopard feels that it's got enough distance to be safe and secure. But for the most part, the senses and the reflexes of the leopards protect them, and the advantages of that calling outweigh the risks. I must tell you something on the subject of the competition. One of the other, one of our guiding friends tells me that he nearly saw one of the two cheetah brothers kill one of the Styx cubs. The Styx cubs are often left on their own as the females go off to hunt, and apparently this male cheetah was several feet away from it, really clearly thinking about hunting and grabbing this little cub before the second cheetah obviously caught whiff of the mother and turned around and raced away, taking his brother with him. But it just goes to show that even cheetah, bottom of the predator hierarchy, bottom of the food chain almost in that sense, will go out of their way to reduce the competition. And for them, an adult lion is their biggest threat so removing it while it's still young and relatively defenseless kind of makes sense. We are of course thrilled to hear that that little cub has made it safely out of harm's way. Tingana, if it had been Tingana that had stumbled upon those sticks cubs, things might have been a very different story. And speaking of our lion and... Oh, hold on. What's happening? Why are you calling? We're going to sit here and try and figure out exactly what's happening with Tingana and why it is that he's calling in the middle of the day, which is... Not unheard of, but it is relatively unusual. And while we try and puzzle that one out and I listen for the calls of a responding leopard, let's jump on the back with James, who is searching for another one of our big cats. Now, we did find her, everybody. We found the lioness that Brian and I saw yesterday that you all found on the Jumadam cam for us. And if you look over there, there's a jackalberry tree that we could see from the other side. But we couldn't, we just didn't have a good view of the lioness. Now, she should be just ahead of us now. So we're going to push gently through here. We saw her with the three tiny little cubs from yesterday. And so we want to drive very carefully and as quietly as possible. But of course, driving quietly through bush of this exceptional density is not very easy, is it, Brian? No, no, no. It is quite noisy. So, I mean, in theory, she should be right here. Just amongst these trees. Hold on, everybody. This could be very exciting. Hello, Shamel. You're interested in how many cubs there are with the Inkahumas. As far as I can tell, there are eight now. Three, two, and three. You got them, Brian? Brian's got them, everyone. There we are. Yes, just have a look through there. I'm going to ask Brian to put the camera on her just so that you can have an idea of how brilliant Brian's eyes are. There she is. And there are the little ones suckling. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, it's fantastic. Okay, let's try and get a little bit closer. I don't think they're going anywhere. So, Shamel, three here, two in one litter, and three in the other litter, as far as I can remember. 
Oof, uh, there should be a very nice view once we get round the corner here. As quietly as I said, watch your heads, everybody. Zizifus mukranata, buffalo thorn. Right, now be quiet, everyone. Don't shout. You'll be tempted to squeal loudly when you see these things because they are so very cute. Brian, how's that for you? Everyone, there are lots of trees, but we're close enough now. I will try and move a little bit forward once they're completely used to us and once the lioness is completely comfortable. Isn't that wonderful? There we go. Ah, all is right with the world on Sunday. <laughs> what a rare joy. Well, not so rare these days, but you know. <laughs> Hello, Brian in Johannesburg, my old hometown, and Brian's hometown. You say you're watching Safari Live in 26 degrees in Johannesburg. That's a wonderful day in Johannesburg. And you say that you're having a braai. Now, to those of you who don't know what that means, a braai is a barbecue in South Africa. I'm just going to talk to Aubrey. Go ahead, Aubrey. Oh, this is wonderful. Aubrey, go ahead. And just hear a little bit of the wind blowing in the trees there. It's a very perfect afternoon. Mm. Hello Haley in England. You're wondering about when this lioness is going to introduce these little cubs to the pride. Haley, it's normally at about six weeks. I think these things are about that age, no, well, maybe not quite there yet. They're probably about four or five weeks old, but it's not long before they're introduced to the pride. It'll be very soon, I think. I think, well, I'm just trying to think which ones these are. This, this must be the three that we found and the little, tiny, tiny little ones that we had at Buffleshook Dam just before I went, Brian and I went on leave last. I'm sure that's this three. Well, these three. And therefore, they must be almost six weeks now. Isn't that sweet? What I'm going to do is just depress the clutch and we'll sneak a little bit forward. I'll try and get that tree wisteria out of the way. One of them got a little bit of a fright. That's totally normal. They're very relaxed, so I'm not too worried. Or mum's very relaxed, which means they will get relaxed too. Brian, tell me when you've got a decent view there. How's that? Okay, there we go, everyone. Now we won't move. Oof, can you smell that, Brian? I think uh, Mummy's relieved herself somewhere close by. What an amazing sighting. This is the way to spend Sunday afternoon, everybody, after a substantial Sunday lunch. Hmm. 
<laughs> a little thing staring at us. And of course, lions in the middle of the day, normally dreadfully boring things to look at. But of course, these ones, because they are some little cubs, mum is awake, the cubs are awake and having fun together. So I'm, I'm going with about six weeks old, I think these are, and they were moving with her yesterday, which means that they were probably, um, it means that, you know, that she has kind of probably introduced them to the pride already, although she's spending obviously some time on her own still. Let me just go a little bit forward, just because there's one playing with mum's tail that's quite amusing. You see that one, Brian? Just because this, unfortunately, this. Uh... <laughs> that is the most irritating noise in the world. Okay, ready? Okay, there we are, everyone. This has been just brilliant. So tired after a heavy Sunday lunch of lion milk. Oh, and now they're starting to make those lovely noises they make. Um, Roger, you say you'd love to pick one up, but you're, you assume that their little teeth and claws hurt. Yes, they do. Not quite as much as mother's teeth and claws will hurt. Where you should get out and try and pick one up. But yes, absolutely, they've got sharp teeth and claws. And mum's up. Off she goes. Please don't go with her. No, we can't get through there. That's very unkind of them to move down into the drainage line there. She's calling them. We will definitely try and follow them, everyone. This is just the best. <laughs> They're running off there. And you hear their little ow, ow. Oh, this is too great. <laughs> wow, we. Um, right, now, the complication of trying to get into that position. Do you think she went to sleep? Oh, I can see her. She's lying in the shade down there, everyone. So we'll try and get in there um, and watch her from the top of the bank. I think while we do that, let's go across to Jamie, uh, who I think is still with that magnificent male leopard. I'm very sorry to disappoint you, but I'm absolutely not still with our leopard. He got up and moved. And I don't know where he's moved to at all. He came in this direction. He was calling. I think I saw movement. Hold on. No, I think I imagined that. He came through somewhere in this direction. There was a go away bird that called once, but then it went quiet again. I don't know where he went. He, he went, the reason I lost him was because he went through one of the river systems where I absolutely couldn't cross without going around and through to the other side. And I know exactly where he crossed because if I go forward a little bit, my marker that I was using 
is a vulture's nest that is sitting at the top of this knob thorn tree. And interestingly enough, just by the way, a little random aside, the vultures are nesting. They should have laid their eggs by now. So I was using that as a marker. He should have popped out somewhere here. The difficulty with leopards, of course, is sometimes they move and then they just go and lie down in the shade somewhere. And it might be that he's done that, though. I suspect he's going to go and have a drink. That's where he's off to. Or there's another leopard in the area, which we might not have realized, because that calling suggests he was in the middle of the day makes me wonder about why he might be up to that. So while we go and try and find him once again for you all, let's go back to James and those amazing lions that are just off Hyena Road. There they are, now having a meal in the midst of the cool sand there of the drainage line. Well, one of them's having a meal, the others aren't. Beautiful, just beautiful. Jean in Oklahoma, a very good question from you about what happens when mum goes hunting? What does she do? Does she put them, teach them to climb a tree or hide them in bushes or stash them or what? No, she will normally stash them in a bush, Jean. And then they'll wait very patiently. When they get a bit older, they get a bit naughty and they'll start to play. Uh, instead of doing exactly as, as they're told, which is to just lie still, like any sort of normal kid. Um, they don't climb trees though, not c completely unlike the leopards. I'm not sure why it is that lion cubs don't climb trees, but they don't. And I suppose they're probably, if they were desperate, they might be able to. But I've never seen a lion cub in a tree. Hello Valeria, you said do I have any names coming to mind for these little cubs? Uh, not at this stage, no. I mean there are three of them and so we, I suppose we should name them after a famous three but we need to sex them really before we name them and of course they'll lose their names as they get older probably because if they are males they'll eventually leave the area. Mum being very patient, but qu clearly quite exhausted. Let me get the binoculars out. Brian, can you super zoom in on the one that's lying down with its backside facing us? We might be able to sex it. No, too late. She moved. He or she? <laughs> so right from a very, very early age, they fight with each other for food. Kathy, you say they look so harmless and cute. How big are they in comparison with the domestic cat? Um, they're probably about the size of a domestic cat now, Kathy. And yes, they probably are pretty harmless at this age. I think you could probably, you know, you hear these of these places where people play with lions and they can go and, you know, spend time with lion cubs. They'd probably be about this age, the lion cubs, and so you could probably safely play with them. But they don't stay like that for long. They are very playful. She's got a bit of an injury there on her shoulder. See that? Mm. Hello, old Yin in Edinburgh. Very nice to hear from you there. Of course, the world's most beautiful accent, probably, from Edinburgh. Um, not that that's what it sounds like. Old Yin, you're interested in what I think of leucistic lion breeding. So leucistic lion, for those of you who don't know, is a lion that is, um, well, it's a white lion, basically. 
very pale compared with normal and you want you want to know what I think of breeding them in captivity just hold on one second sorry uh, afternoon orbs uh, the lioness and cubs still static on Nyala Road North um, my impression my point of view on that is quite clear I don't believe that I don't believe that it's a good idea I don't believe that it has any conservation value a leukistic lion is a, li a leukistic lion is not um, Sorry, the radio is going crazy in my ear. Yeah, Orbs, we did get that. Thanks very much. I haven't been there yet. So, I don't believe that there's any value in, in breeding lions like that in captivity. They The genes for leukism, white lions, occur naturally in the wild. Sorry, I must just turn this radio off before I go ballistically crazy in my ear. Um... And they, so the genes for white lions exist all over in the wild, but they're only expressed uh, rarely because they are recessive genes. And so to breed them in the wild in captivity is the same as this very odd propensity, especially in South Africa, to breed rare game. So black impala or golden gnus or these, all these strange recessive traits that do occur naturally in the wild from time to time. But because they're recessive and they're not particularly adaptively successful, they don't move into the population at large and they don't express themselves in the population at large. So to breed leukistic lions or golden gnus or black impala or any of these other rare and exotic species is of almost no conservation value whatsoever. And doubled with that, of course, the effect of having lions in captivity really probably quite a bad idea. A lion is easy to keep when it's this age. As soon as it gets to mum's age, however, they're not tameable. They don't tame. You can't keep them in a... Um, I mean, you can't really keep them as domestic animals, and they don't domesticate well. They are wild. They are potentially very dangerous when they're adults, especially if they are used to people and they're not afraid of people. And so I think that the captive breeding of any lion is, yeah, one hesitates to say always bad, but I think it's almost without exception a bad idea. So I hope that answers your question all the way from Edinburgh. Everyone, when I say the radio is going crazy in my ear, what I mean, everyone, for those of you, perhaps new viewers, is that the game drives from the commercial lodges around here, like Juma and Kachita Plains and Arethusa, they're all starting to get moving now, because their guests go out a little bit after we do. They have their tea on the deck overlooking the water holes, which is a very civilized thing to do. And now they're just getting mobile, so they, their rangers call in on the radio to find out what's been going on. We are very, very lucky here, everyone. This is not something you do every single day. Brock, a very nice one from you. So you know, of obviously, that the makeup of a lion pride is females and their youngsters. And you want to know if a female lion would ever leave a lion pride to set up another pride. The answer is most likely not Brock. It's highly unlikely. The reason for that, of course, is that she finds safety within a pride like this. And the general state of affairs is that if any of these cubs are females, what they'll do is remain in this pride. There's no real reason for them to go off unless the pride gets very big. Now, in this kind of area, prides are normally sort of five females or so, plus their attendant offspring. But you can see very quickly that if, for example, these five females of the Inkuhuma pride, they've suddenly got eight extra lions. Now, four of those are probably female plus minus. Suddenly you've got a pride of nine now. Two of them still haven't given birth, so we could have a pride of 12 or 15 plus attendant offspring. So very quickly, the pride could go from five to 20 or so. Th at that point, sort of 20 to 24, you'd find it might split. 
Now that's not going to be one lioness going off and forming her own pride. It'd be probably two groups of closely related females going off separately and creating their own prides. If that makes sense. Beautiful sighting this. We're very lucky to have this kind of view. I don't know if you were with us yesterday afternoon, but Brian and I spent quite a hairy moment or two trying to find the lions in a drainage line quite a long way from here. And eventually we managed to spot them and it was just such a joy. We didn't get much of a view, and so it's perfect that we've now come here to spend a bit of time with them. Not say, so, Brian. Mm -hmm. It feels right, doesn't it? It does yes. indeed. Don't turn over. <laughs> now, of course, they're going to want to go over the other side. going to make life a little difficult for us. See how mum is panting there? Too sweet. Look at this. Look at them. Monique, you're in London. You say there's lioness eaten recently. No, I don't think she has. She doesn't look particularly full to me. In fact, she looks slightly the opposite. So no, I don't think she's fed for a little while. Certainly the cubs seem to be feeding. Um, they were at, if I'm not mistaken, they were, actually made it to the Juma Dam cam yesterday evening from where we saw them. But quite late on at night, I think Connor said around 3 a.m. And they came back this way and I know that Jamie and Brent, uh, sorry, one o'clock, and I think Jamie and Brent were looking for them this morning. They knew they were in here somewhere but didn't find them. And then somebody on a late game drive this morning just drove past on the road and she'd brought them out onto the road. And that's how we managed to get to them. I'd love to say that Brian and I, with our superb tracking skills, got them in here, but that is not the case, is it, Brian? No. No, <laughs> alas not. Alas. Sharon, you want to know how many nipples the lion has. Uh, she's got four. Four what we call inguinal mammy. Inguinal meaning sort of uh, on the belly, as opposed to pectoral, which all the primates and the elephants have. And if they're pectoral, they're normally, uh, they're normally two. Hyenas, interestingly, also only have two, but they're at the back, like this, in Guinal. But interestingly, also, hyenas have smaller litters, and they also don't cross-suckle. So this lioness, when she rejoins the pride with these cubs, which will be very soon, I'm pretty sure, she will suckle the other cubs in the pride, and likewise, these cubs will go across to some of the other lionesses and try and feed from them. One does have to sort of pinch oneself every so often just to make sure that you are actually aw awake. We're sitting here in the middle of the north, well, middle of the Sabi Sands, western fringes of the Kruger Park, Sunday afternoon, and there's a lioness there with three little six-week or five or six-week-old cubs just sort of being while we're here, which I think is remarkable. It's quite easy to get a bit blasé about this stuff. <laughs> Hello, Gracie. 
aged just eight, soon, of course, to be nine, very soon, in fact. Uh, Gracie, you say, are they, <laughs> they're so snuggly, but are they the size of a kitten, and how old are they? Gracie, they're six weeks old, they're not the size of a kitten, I know they look like that on the screen, but they're actually about the size of a pretty big house cat, so if you think of a cat at home, or any cat that you've met, these things are probably about this, that size. So they're much bigger than kittens, even though they look like kittens. I mean, you cannot believe the weather either. I mean, it's 30 degrees here, middle of winter. Possibly a slight Indian summer. I think we'll get another couple of cold snaps before the real spring sets in. Certainly Brian in Johannesburg, who mentioned the fact that he's sitting having a braai at home now, which is a barbecue, as I explained, he will be well aware that Johannesburg especially will suffer a, no doubt, will suffer a September cold snap. All right, let's go back across to Jamie for a short update. I'm a bit confused by that leopard, so I hope that she will have some light to shed on a situation. Well, the only thing is, is that the leopard has disappeared, but he can't have got all that far away from us. So what we've done is we've called in Sean and his tracker reef to help us out in terms of relocating them. So we're going to try and find him. Um, where, where he was before, where those off-road tracks end, he went straight across the Shkorva from there and then this way. Yeah, more south. Yeah. Going further south. Okay. Okay, I will do. I'll keep you updated. So that was Reef. He's telling me where to go. And... <laughs> I know. He might be lying there still. I really enjoy Reef. He's so he's such a fun person and he's so so good at what he does. So he's told us to go and drive the power lines. I'm not going to be questioning him. I'm just going to be doing exactly that, and we'll go and see if he hasn't popped out there. Reef could track a bird through the skies. So while we go and do what we're told, in terms of helping to relocate Tingana, let's go back to James and those lovely lion cubs. Just in case you thought that I was in fact remotely um, talking about this from some distance away, I am actually at the sighting with Brian Joubert and his thumb. Oh, wait. The tumbleweed thumb. There it is. <laughs> A particular highlight of the Sunday sunset safari. Back to the lions. Now, I've taken a number of rank average photographs. But even I am able to get one or two in focus at this sighting. Normally, of course, their eyes are shut when I depress the shutter. Yes, they were sort of open there. Now, Rob. You're in New, in New Jersey and you want to know about the weaning and when they wean from their, lion, from their mum's milk. Rob, there's a nice way of remembering this with the lions, and that, of course, is the number of the devil. Uh, that's not to say that there's anything uh, devilish about lions, but six, six, six. So six days before they open their eyes, six weeks before they join the pride, six months before they wean. So it's quite a nice way to remember it. Well, that's how I always remembered it. Six days to eye opening, six weeks to joining the pride, six months to weaning. 
This is incredible. Brian, one struggles to know where to look, you know. Mm. Mum is very, very happy there, and I think you'll find she's so very happy, of course, because that sand is cool. And she's in the shade. Some somebody asked if she. I thought she'd just um, if she'd fed. I don't. Th she looks very comfortable, you know, and she's panting quite hard. So maybe she has. I might be wrong. I I wonder if she didn't eat something last night. So that that was Monique in London who asked that. So Monique, I'm going to modify what I've said to you. I think she has eaten, given the panting. It's difficult to tell, you see, when they're lactating, because their bellies always look slightly full. That one, of course, is not panting at all. That is the picture of relaxed little lion. And as all of you are thinking, how nice it would be to pick one of those up and give it a bit of a cuddle. Which, um, of course, in principle is true, but in practice, really not a good idea. And I was chatting to somebody the other day, and, you know, somebody, a fr friend of mine in Johannesburg, and they were all excited because someone had brought lion cubs to the school where their kids are, and I was just scandalized. I couldn't believe that that sort of thing was going on in South Africa. It really has been shown to be a rather dreadful practice because, like I say, they do grow up into that rather terrifying beast lying in between. And... Yeah, they're not. You can't keep them in dom domestic c confines when they become adult. That's very sweet, Brian. Look at the little claws. Those little things will be like razor blades. So tired, but not tired enough to close the eyes yet. It's like a child fighting sleep. I had another rather fascinating conversation with somebody about sleep the other day, which I shall get into now once we've answered Angie's question. Angie, you're in Ohio and you say, how's the cub with the injured paw? We haven't seen them for a while, Angie, so I'm not sure. It's not one of these three. It's one of the older three. And in case some of you don't know, one of those cubs, or the other three, the oldest litter, I think, in this group, one of them has got a nasty injured, probably coccyx, Jamie reckons, um, so hip joint. And she looked, or he, she or he looked to be limping quite badly. And that's not a good thing for a lion cub. If, that, if it doesn't heal, the pride will eventually leave the cub. And it will be left to fend for itself. So Angie, I don't know. Now as we watch this lion, the little cub sort of fighting off sleep. I had a wonderful um, sort of conversation with somebody the other day about how we as human beings, especially in the Western world, are so desperate to put our children to bed and try and, you know, regulate when they go to bed and that sort of thing. And quite interestingly, this person I was talking to was saying, well, you know, we don't ever do that. We just, the child goes to bed when it wants to go to bed. And I think there might be a bit of a lesson. There might be a bit of a lesson for us from the lions. Of course, these lions sleep when they're tired. And they're awake when they like to be. It's probably, I wonder if it's slightly more exhausting for mum. She also sleeps when she wants to, of course. And everything rather calm down now. This, of course, is what everybody should be doing on a Sunday afternoon, not so, Brian? Mm. Fast asleep. A good old afternoon siesta. A good old afternoon siesta. And there was a pearl-spotted owl calling behind us, and that has lulled our little cub fighting its sleep into dreamland. And out again. Look at that. Isn't that sweet?
Kim, you're in Florida and you're wondering at what point in time you're going to be able to identify the gender of the cubs. Kim, the answer is right now, if we get them uh, enough, uh, you know, if we get a good, good enough view of their backsides, we'll definitely see them. Station on Nyala Road North, come in. There's just somebody who's driven past us. Okay, Cobby, you should, you know, you probably got a view from that side, but you can try the side. I think it's going to be fascinating to see them get a giant land cruiser into where we are. Before they get here, I'm going to suggest we do a little bit of a move, just so that there's a bit of space when they come in here. I don't want to disturb them, but we're going to move just a little. Right, while I move, let's just pop across to Jamie and find out what's going on with the recalcitrant Tinganana. Tinganana, Tingana, as he's officially called, is playing very hard to get. And I. Sorry, I'm just listening to the game drive comms at the same time, which unfortunately I cannot put on silent mode. Oh, I can actually, that's working now. Sort of. Anyway, so I'm desperately looking for Tingana. I'm reluctant to leave him just yet because I want to try and work out exactly what it was he was calling about or why he was calling. Because he was very much for a leopard with a full belly on a hot day. He was very keen on being on the move. Well, I think if we don't have any luck here, luckily Reef is still in the block helping us look. If we don't have any luck here, I'm going to move my search further afield. Perhaps he's thirsty. Maybe he's going to go and have a drink. After a night spent sawing and a morning spent sawing, perhaps his voice is feeling a little bit parched and he would like something to wet the back of his throat. And the nearest place that he could do that is the Arethusa Dam. So that'll be our next port of call. It's very difficult in this area. The vegetation is exceptionally thick. I just have a funny feeling he's still here, though. I wish he'd give us one more call. We have been stopping every now and again, stopping and just switching off and listening very, very carefully for the sound of him rasping away again. And he's gone silent once more. All right, and back we go. I'm also hoping if he is still moving, perhaps the monkeys and the go-away birds will give his position away. The tricky thing with Tingana on foot is you've got to be very, very careful not to get close to him because otherwise he just moves away. He actually runs, not runs, he just sort of slowly slinks away from you. He's not like Karula. Karula's lovely on foot. Karula will sit and watch you perfectly relaxed, but Tingana will slink away and move into a different area, which makes him hard to track down on foot and then follow up with the vehicle. We're going to focus just a little bit longer on finding this leopard. And while we do, let's go back to James and those adorable lion cubs. We've just done a little bit of a move around, everybody. Uh, nothing much has changed since you were last here, except Mum has moved around. I've also assessed that I think the chances of that land cruiser getting into where we are now is almost negligible. So I think we're going to be on our own with these little things for a while. What a pity, Brian. Isn't that sad? It's so lonely here. Here comes the other one. What's thinking about coming out? So sweet. Uh, 
Hello, Isabella. You're just five years old and you're wondering about their tongues and how scratchy they are. They are definitely scratchy, Isabella. They're probably a sc much scratchier than a house cat's tongue. And mum's tongue, of course, is very, very scratchy. It's the scratchiest kind of a tongue. It would be like steel wool. I don't know if you know what steel wool is, but I'm sure you've probably got some in the kitchen at home. And it's the kind of thing you use to clean a pot with. And that's what mum's tongue will feel like. And these little ones probably feel quite a lot like house cats, maybe a little bit rougher than house cats. Remember, they don't want to have their tongues don't want to be too rough at this stage. And a lovely question from someone with the rather bizarre moniker of Blobbit MacBlob. Blobbit MacBlob, thank you for joining us this afternoon, wherever you happen to be blobbing about the place. Uh, you say, <laughs> it really is very special, some of the names that people come up with. Blobbit? You wouldn't have the cub, cub, something about the cub's blue eyes. I'm afraid I failed to hear the question once I heard your name. But yes, the cubs do have blue eyes. And they start out blue, and then, well, they're bluish brown. And then they go to the sort of normal greeny lion colour. You can see there, there is definitely a tinge of blue. Not as blue as leopard cubs' eyes often start out at. Now, Hosanna and Shongile, um, they they certainly started out with the brown eyes already but often leopards will start off with blue eyes and these chaps have got relatively blue eyes would you say they're blue brian more gray they're not very blue though are they so blobber to mcblob a little bit of blue there some gray difficult to tell of course because all of our screens are calibrated differently But from where I'm sitting, they look pretty grey. Not exactly the colour of the sky. Look at that little thing. Kathy, <laughs> it's a lovely question. I've never thought about this before. You say, what do I think these cubs smell like? Well, I hope they don't smell like their mother, because their mother you know, will be a bit niffy. But they are quite fastidious cleaners, and they will be cleaned by their mother all the time. I think you'd find they probably don't smell dissimilar from a, a house cat, I imagine. Um, it may be a bit niffier, a bit dirtier than that, but yeah, not, not bad. I certainly can't smell them from where I'm sitting now. And, you know, that's one of the things, of course, I think it's one of the major reasons that cats clean themselves. I don't think it's because they necessarily want to be clean. I think it's because that way back in evolutionary past, and, well, in the case of lions now, they want to be scentless so that their animals, their prey species, don't pick them up on the wind. And I think that's why they're such fastidious cleaners and why the stalking predators like leopard and lion are much more fastidious cleaners than say the uh, coursing predators like wild dogs or hyenas. You might just be able to hear a little bit of the wind rustling in the leaves. It's a hot northwester today and as I was saying yesterday you would, in a normal year of rain, be worried about fires in weather like this. Hot, dry, windy. No grass at the moment, so we don't have to worry about fires, which is something of a relief. Wouldn't you say, Brian? Because escaping from here in the middle of a bushfire would be, well, something of a trial. Well, this is a nice one from James Bear because it's not that easy to answer and it has many, ooh, <laughs> many varied, many
many varied sort of uh, permutations. He said, what age do they start exerting dominance over each other? James, they don't really. Um, well, they do and they don't. The females probably don't, won't. They won't exert, there's no real hierarchy, except at a kill site where the biggest and most aggressive will feed first because she's prepared to have a fight. But there will be, if these are all females, you'll find that they probably have got almost exactly the same sort of dominance slash um, ranking. If they're male, eventually when they get into a position where they're in a coalition, I think it will depend quite strongly. Um, I think it will depend quite strongly on how much testosterone they have and that testosterone will be defined probably genetically. So if we look at the... Um, sorry, the radio's going again in my ear. If we look at the, uh, the Birmingham boys, it's quite interesting to watch. They had a big fight the other day that Jamie watched, and I think she interpreted it exactly correctly. Amber Eyes coming into Estrus, and they were fighting over mating. It was very clear there that there was a battle for dominance. But when they're in a coalition and trying to take over a territory, it really is very unclear as to whether there is a dominance hierarchy or not. Sometimes there isn't. In the case of the Matimba males, I think it was quite clear that Hairy Belly was bigger and he had a, a darker mane, so he had more testosterone, so he was probably more dominant. It's only once they're adults, though. It's completely unlike it is with dogs. So in a dog pack, you know from the time they open their eyes, they start to develop a ranking within the litter. You can see that with wild dogs, you can see it with domestic dogs, and I'm pretty sure you can probably see uh, exactly how it is uh, with wolves as well. So it's very different for the cats. I'm just going to call in again here on the radio, everyone. People are starting to get come close by here. Sorry, no, I'm not going to. There's much talking on the radio still. Now, Karula, unfortunately, everybody, um, Aubrey did find she went south again into Little Gari, so we won't see her tonight. Hello Jenny, you're in Cape Town. That's very nice. Uh, you say, why have they got these spots on their heads? Well, the reason they've got spots on their heads is the same reason that a leopard has got spots. Remember that when she leaves them, she will leave them in an area like, for example, if Brian pans to the left there, there's a thicket. Now look at the light in that thicket. If you zoom into that thicket there, Brian, if you don't mind, just behind her tail there. That's it. That's the kind of area where they'll stay. Now, that spotted uh, top of the head and spotted body and sort of black mantle on the back will really disguise them nicely in a position like that. When they get older, they get too big to hide from animals. Um, and so they have this tawny color which helps them in the winter and it helps them at night to stay kind of semi-camouflaged but they're too big to actually hide and stalk through the thickets like a leopard would, and they don't have that hunting strategy. So it's only while the little ones need to remain hidden from other predators that they have those spots, and then they lose them once they get a bit bigger. And another fairly silent afternoon, you know, not much in the way of bird calls. Yesterday, almost completely silent, right until the end of the drive. very tired. <laughs> so just have a listen and you might just be able to hear the call of the white-browed scrub robin going. That's all. Very quiet. That's a turnover. Yes, high action here, everybody. Oh, camera. Don't move. That's it. That's it. Well done. <laughs> I think I got one, Brian. Yes. 
astounding. I think she's probably looking at vultures, everyone. I'm just looking above us. She is looking at vultures. They are so high up, probably about, oh, I would say almost a kilometer up, flying off to the east towards Mozambique. Do you think they're going on holiday, Brian? Probably. They're probably going to the beach, aren't mm. they? Supping on some Mozambican prawns this evening in a Dodge Inn. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Gerda, a very valid question from you. You say, when the pri she introduces them to the pride and eventually to the males, how do they know if they belong? Or how do the males know that these are theirs? Well, they know because no other males are allowed in this area. I'm not convinced they always know who of the coalition is the father or not. But I think also, as with just about all these cats, I'm fairly convinced that recognition is largely a smell thing. I think that they smell familiar, they smell like home in the same way that your mother smelt like home to you, or possibly still does, and in the same way that your children, any of you who have children, smell like home to you. And there's a familiarity, you know, it's the same as, um, you know, I've got, I don't have kids, um, but I have nephews, and those nephews smell familiar to me because they come from very similar genetics, of course. And I think that it's the same for the animals out here with their far more sensitive noses and ability to pick up pheromones and different scents. The other thing I would like you all to take note of and be grateful for in the same way that I am is that there's no one else with us. We're on our own here. We don't normally get to spend this amount of time with brand new lion cubs. Normally, we'll have to move out. But nobody else seems to want to come here, except that fellow who was in his big land cruiser. I suspect he's probably lodged himself on a fairly large log not too far from here, and uh, we'll probably spend the best part of the next six weeks trying to get off it. Not so, Brian. Hello, Tammy. You want to know about... Um, sorry, the radio again. Uh, you want to know about whether or not, uh, or how many cubs have been born in this area, and... Sorry, Kirsten, I've lost the other one. One sec, Tammy. It's coming again. Ah, and is there a specific time of year? So the first question is, this, uh, with this particular pride, eight cubs, the Styx pride has another eight, but they, I'm not sure, they've come on to Juma, I think once or twice with those cubs. They're currently on Cheetah Plains. There is no specific time of the year, but the reason it perhaps looks like it is, there is a time of year, of course, is that these are the first litters of the Birmingham boys. This is their first time to mate. It's the first time that they've produced offspring. So it's not surprising that the females of both the Styx Pride and the Ngahuma Pride, which are dominated by the Birmingham boys, it's not surprising that they're all giving birth at the same time. If the Birmingham boy takeover had happened three months after it did, it happened in sort of July last year, if it had happened a year later than, or three months after that, you'd find that these cubs would be three months further along. So they're not seasonal breeders, but because of the, the way the Birmingham boys took over the area and because of the way lion dynamics work and all lion takeovers happen in that way, you'll find that the first litters from a new coalition will be relatively at the same time and then it'll kind of spread out after that. And that works for the lions because it means that they can cross suckle, it means they can look after each other's cubs. She's definitely eaten. Monique, look at her belly now. Orbs, go for it. I think your best approach is going to be on Nyala Road North. You should get a view from there. 
I've just managed to get this small vehicle in from the other side, but I think you're going to struggle to get a big vehicle in here. So try from Nyala Road North first, and then if you don't get a view, I'll try and guide you around from Gori Pan. Aubrey's going to come and have a look. Now, I just want to, while Brian is showing you that one, I just want to look at this female and just see. No, I thought for a minute that uh, one nipple wasn't working, but it isn't that at all. It's just that her belly is so full of meat that it's at an odd angle. Yeah, Monique, she had a big meal last night. Deb in Connecticut, a nice one from you also because it's not an obvious answer or an answer that has one answer. You say, will she hunt on her own or will she join the pride to hunt? She'll do both. She will do absolutely both. Ooh. So she, I suspect that she probably hunted on her own last night. We didn't see any evidence of the rest of the pride today. So I suspect that she probably hunted on her own. And she will be very successful hunting on her own. Lions can survive well on their own. And we think the reason they live in prides is far more for the protection of youngsters than it is for their ability to hunt. A lioness on her own, very capable of hunting for herself. And indeed, I mean, in some research shows that lionesses on their own actually eat more when they're on their own than in prides. But their cubs obviously have a substantially less or smaller chance of surviving. She's just scratching now. I don't know if you noticed as she rolled over, she's very clearly got a bit of a skin infection and she's giving it a bit of a scratch, which of course she shouldn't be. All right, let's go across to Jamie, find out what the update is there. I'm not sure what's happening with Tinganana. Very recalcitrant he's been this afternoon. Fascinating to see what he's been doing. Recalcitrant is perhaps the best word to describe Tingana. Um, sneaky is another one. Mysterious is another. And a few other choice ones come to mind. But Tingana has vanished completely. And so we've decided to actually pretty much abandon the search and look for other things to show you. But I have moved into this lovely area around Arethusa, just to the west of the dam, that is full of beautiful Tamburti trees. Got overexcited by a hyena track. Beautiful Tamburti and jackalberry trees. It was a favorite haunt of Shadow and Sindile when Sindile was still with her. The female leopard that lives in this area and her now nearly two-year-old cub. It's also quite a long time since we've seen Shadow and her... Well, I've seen Shadow, but to see Shadow and her cub has also been something that we haven't seen in a while. I'm just stopping to look and listen quickly. Because the cysticulars are quite cross. Chup, 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 chup. Nothing else has been very close. I haven't heard any alarm calls, but the cysticulars are a little bit unhappy. Which can mean anything from a snake to a leopard. And I'm not skilled enough, I don't think many of us are skilled enough to determine the difference between a cysticular alarm calling it a leopard, an alarm calling it a snake, or perhaps a slender mongoose. But it might just be worth following up and just checking along this road since it is one of the leopards' favorite highways. All the leopards, not all of them, all of the leopards in this area, so Shadow, Tingana. The nice thing for Shadow is that it seems as though Salaheshe has moved back further to the west. Salaheshe is a female leopard that's been putting a little bit of pressure on poor Shadow in terms of moving further and further into her territory. And by the sounds of it recently, she spent more time in Simbambili than she has mo moving into Shadow's territory on Arethusa, which is good news for Shadow because the more space she has, the better in terms of being able to raise that little cub of hers. As to where she went, she is about as mysterious as Tingana.
stopping to check somewhere in the Strainage Line. I have good memories of the Strainage Line. It's where Sindile followed me back to the car many, many years ago, months ago. Sarah, who is one of our regular viewers in Ohio, I am sorry, I know you've asked a question about why I think you've asked, do I think that perhaps Tingana might have heard the mating pair? And, or a mating pair, and that's why he moved and started to call in the way he did. But to be 100% honest with you, Vim, can you hear anything? No. I can't, we can't quite hear exactly what your questions are, so we're not ignoring your questions. We're just struggling to hear them a little bit, unfortunately. But I think that was your question, and that is a possibility. If it was the case, though, it would not have been the mating pair that we tracked this morning. Dumbulla and whoever he was mating with moved further north into Buffel's Hook, which is very, very far away from where we are now. But that might have been one of the reasons behind his response. He might just not have finished his territorial patrol. He got distracted by the meal that he caught, his warthog or whatever else it happened to be. He got distracted by that and he hadn't quite finished patrolling as far as he wanted to patrol. Now maybe that's an explanation behind why it is that he started to call in the way that he did. But to be completely 100% honest with you, I'm not, I really don't know exactly what it was that caused that response. He might just, you know, leopards don't read the textbooks. He might just have decided that this was a perfectly appropriate, entirely appropriate time to start calling. And that's exactly what he did. I just wanted to check this road quickly, but I think I'm going to go to Arethusa Dam, see what's decided to pop around there and to have a look at the water level. And let's go back to James and his lovely sleepy lions. And they ain't so sleepy right now, everybody. They're deciding to get up and do something useful with their lives. Which is always nice to see, you know. It's nice to see the youth being useful, don't you think, Brian? Oh, yes. Yes. It's wonderful. It's important. It is. We don't want them lurking about. No. No. <laughs> Very sweet. Oh, good one from you, James Richard. Um, you're wondering about the suckle marks and how long it will take for those suckle marks to disappear once she stops suckling. I think you'll probably find it'll take about a month. They're quite severe. I mean, those marks are quite severe. And although it will be very clear that she isn't suckling, uh, if you look at them after, say, a month, you will definitely be able to see still uh, that she has been a mother from the discoloration of the fur normally. go. Oh, that's going to be a nice picture. Even for me. Um, this is fantastic. I'm just going to have to get on the radio, everyone. KT1 Lioness with cubs on Nyala Road North. Three stations here, but I'll move out if you want to come. Okay, great, thank you. At the moment, visual probably only for one vehicle, maybe two. This is just brilliant, everyone. Look at them playing there. Yeah, this is fantastic. Go ahead, Duncan. Yeah, 
Duncan, it probably is. We did come in from Central, but that was a long way around. We had to come through the drainage. I misread where that was. So I'd say Gwari Pan, definitely your best route, yeah. I'm just trying to help him get in here, everybody. I think if he does get manage to get here, we'll have to move out. But for the meantime, we can stay right where we are. Because, of course, um, well, there's no one else, no one else pressuring us to leave. So, just to confirm, for those of you who are perhaps new, the idea with a with a view like this is that you'd only be able to move maybe two or three vehicles into the sighting. Three is the absolute limit. Often with cubs, it's just two. Um, so in this case, if somebody else comes to where we are now, we'll have to move out, I'm afraid. But that's okay, we've had an incredible view. William, you're a new viewer. Welcome and thank you for sending us a question. You say if a cub isn't accepted into a new pride, will a mother stay with them and sort of, I don't know, um, will they forge a, a route on their own? Um, William, it's highly unlikely that a cub would ever be rejected from a pride. I don't think that that's happened. Well, I mean, I'm sure it's happened once or twice, but it's not very likely. In fact, it's highly unlikely that that would happen. So... I mean, the basic answer is no. If a, if a lion is rejected, or then it, would, it will normally die. The mother, you see, the mother can't afford to sacrifice herself. Because if a mother sacrifices herself, it means the cub will die anyway. So, you know, she's taking a risk if she leaves the pride to look after a cub, and she wouldn't do that. This isn't a bad sighting, is it, Brian? Yeah, right. Most enjoyable indeed. I'm just a little bit irritated with Tingana that he's managed to give poor old Jamie the slip. Clearly something up with him. It's just unbelievable. I mean, the photo opportunities here, I'm sure many of you are taking beautiful screenshots of the amazing compositions Brian is achieving. I'm certainly taking lots and lots of rank average photographs. At least some good ones of the scenery. Yes, I've got some good ones of the scenery. You're good. Well, I was the world's la greatest landscape photographer, of course. Rita, yes, you're in Johannesburg and you say, it's a good question, you say, if the pride splits like we discussed earlier, would they recognize each other and would they then sort of, would they fight? They would recognize each other and often it's kind of a, um, what they call them is like a breakaway, so they'd say, they'd call this, say, the Nkuhuma breakaway pride if, if this pride split. They can join up again, especially if their numbers start to dwindle but they wouldn't be as territorially aggressive with each other as unrelated prides would be. Good question, very astute. <laughs> and now everyone's tired again. Hello, Denny. A nice one from you about limiting vehicles. Why we limit vehicles at sightings. Denny, because it's just, we don't want to put pressure on them, A, eh, on the animals. So if you've got, for example, a static sighting like this, animals are not moving around, 
Um, it would probably not be bad if you had six or seven vehicles in here as long as they weren't moving. But as soon as the vehicles start moving around, of course, you have a situation where the animals can't hear what's going on, they feel nervous, they um, find it difficult to hear if the potential predators coming up. And then from the other end of the scale, if you're a guest in a place like this, <clears throat> especially in the Sabi sand where it sort of prides itself on the exclusivity of the sightings compared with, say, some East African areas, well, then it's a really good idea that you only have three vehicles in the sighting because it just makes it that much more private, that much more exclusive, and that much more intimate. So two reasons, for the animals and for the people. And there you can see many of them looking. They've turned around to look at Aubrey, who's trying to get into the sighting. Well, Cameron, you're six years old in Ohio, and I'm sure you were five at one stage. In fact, you must have been, but I think that you were five the last time I spoke to you. So if you have just had a birthday, I hope it was a good one. Um, Cameron, very good question. You say, do they sometimes get hurt when they play with each other, like kids do? They do, you know, and we're not really sure how that one that we were speaking about earlier, there's a little cub, um, in the other litter and she's very badly injured. We're not really sure why but it could have been from playing but most likely it was from fighting. Maybe one of the males uh, hit it or maybe one of the females hit it or she got caught in a fight during when they were feeding on a buffalo. So sometimes they get injured but they don't get injured badly playing but the adults, you see how much bigger the adults are? And they're often not that friendly to the little cubs, especially if there's food. <laughs> she was stuck there on that Sisyphus bush. <laughs> Look at the light starting to soften. You can see it changing angles now and just touching the sand here. <laughs> we have been so lucky to have this to ourselves. I've got to tell you everyone, this is, this is very rare. A chap who was trying to get into the sighting is still trying to get in here. I don't know what it is about a lion cub, but you can look at its face, especially if it's yawning and messing around like these are forever and ever. Especially if they start making those noises. Hello, Timo. Timo, we were talking about the cuteness of lions and whether you could pick them up and uh, you want to know about their teeth and when they get their first set. Well, they're born with their first set, Timo. Well, almost. Um, after a few weeks, they'll have, just like a puppy, after a few weeks they will have a full set of teeth. And they have two sets of teeth in their life, Timo. Like most cats or most mammals, they have milk teeth and they have their permanent teeth. Isn't that fantastic? It's just a great big carpet of lions, little baby lions. There will now be great squealing in the final control from Geraldine Cheesecake Kent, who is unable to look at lions without squealing. I understand what she means. I've had to control myself. Right, we're going to sit here for a little bit longer, try and get those other people into the sighting. Uh, Jamie has got an owl. I have to tell you, I'm most impressed with my ability to, or the, the spot that I managed to pull off in this particular scenario. Have you managed to see this owl yet? Can you see it there? It's there. It's on your screen. I'm not telling you where it is yet. Oh, it moved. It gave itself away. 
Did you see it? Have you spotted it yet? We've got a lovely little, what looks like a pearl spotted owl it's sitting in the tree. I Actually, what made me look in that direction was I heard its whistle. And then I just saw a little bit of movement. Look there, the eyes on the back of its head. It's looking around. Where is this threat to my integrity? There's others calling somewhere off in the distance. Might actually be drongos. But how amazingly is that owls, I mean, how amazing is that owl's camouflage? It is absolutely astounding. And, I mean, if we were to, I'd, I'm scared to ask Vim to zoom out in case we lose, in case we lose it again. It took us a considerable period of time to find it. There, look at that. Right. Where's the owl, everybody? <laughs> it's amazing. I'm looking for something, just bear with me one moment, I'm looking in my book to show you the difference between two little owls that are very, very easy to confuse. So just bear with me one moment. We can do a little bit of a lesson on identifying the different types of owl. I'm relatively certain that this is a pearl spotted owlet, although it's so far away. But every now and again it turns its head and it gives us a really nice glimpse of the distinct feature that it has evolved that differentiates it from another species of owl called a barred owlet. And as it turns, uh, no, don't look at us, I want you to turn the other way. This is one of my favorite owl species because they always look so incredibly disapproving. I've lost it now, where's it gone? I've lost it. It left. Did it leave? Mm. Okay, now I thought I was going crazy. I took my eyes off it for one second. All oh, right, it did fly away, okay. <laughs> That's how, um, how confused I was, or how difficult it was to spot. Anyway, so what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about was the, this is the pearl spotted owl. So this is the tiny little owl that we're speaking, we're talking about and we were watching there. It is less than 20 centimeters in height, which makes it, what's that? Less than um, about six inches or so. The barred owlet looks very, very similar, but the difference is, is if you look here along the barring on the chest, and then what I was talking about before, if it turns its head, you might have got to see it. These two distinctive eye-like patterns on the back of the head, basically like the trick that they've been trying with the cattle and painting eyes on the back of cattle to d deter lions, it's something similar, or a moth eye pattern or a butterfly eye pattern. It's kind of an intimidation factor. So those are our two smallest owl species, very easy to confuse unless you're paying close attention. The barred owlet has more white on its belly. I'm making my way towards a different sighting since we haven't had much luck in with Tingana. I'm going somewhere else. So while we trundle off there, let's go back to James and his lions. Go ahead. Yeah, I know we couldn't uh, find out you got in there. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think probably best for that vast vehicle of yours. I'm not sure you would have got it in here. Um, everybody, welcome back to the lion sighting, where the cubs are now doing what they've been doing for much of the afternoon, having a bit of a suckle. Very exciting. Uh, one or two other people have tried to get in here, failed. So <laughs> we'll just stay here. <laughs> this is just very delightful. I've said that about 786 times today. It's difficult to know what else to say.
Hello, Hannah. You're just nine years old and you're in Johannesburg. We started to hear quite a lot from you of late. That's great stuff, Hannah. Um, you want to know about what it is when an adult lion is known as, or when a baby lion is known as an adult lion. Hannah, only when they're about two years old. So up until then, they're considered what we call juveniles. And I suppose they'd stop being called cubs after about a year. Then they'd be youngsters or juveniles. And then when about two, two and a half years, you'd consider them adult. You'd still consider that's because they're, they're really, they could have their own babies when they're two and a half years old. The males, though, I guess because they are, well, they take a bit longer, just like boys take a bit longer to grow up. So the male lions also take a little bit longer to grow up. And you would probably not consider a two and a half year old male an adult, maybe when he's about three or three and a half. But a two and a half year old female lion is very much like, say, a 15 year old female human being. And that's, of course, you know, in history, that, that would have been considered an adult. It's not an adult now. It's still, thankfully, you're still a kid if you're 15 years old. And then I guess a male lion of about four and a half years old would be like an 18-year-old male human being. Does that make sense? You know, everyone, everyone else around the sighting is having to move around so that they can see it from the other side. Brian, I'm starting to think we were extremely clever to get in here, don't you think we were? I do. Very, very clever of us. She's got an issue with her foot there. She keeps, she keeps licking it. She's also got that little injury on her shoulder. And I wonder if there isn't some... Maybe she got injured hunting last night or something like that. Now let's just try and pick out, I mean it would be nice, it's almost impossible to identify these cubs one from the other at the moment. And yet two of them seem to be substantially hungrier than the others. Is that perhaps because one of them is? Maybe there is a sort of dominance hierarchy. There shouldn't be or there isn't sort of a, a textbook dominance hierarchy but maybe there's a little bit of a one. Cubs everywhere you look. Oh, sneezy. Oh, look. Oh, isn't that sweet? That's what we want. There we go. With mum. And on top of mum. <laughs> now that's that little... Remember I mentioned where I thought she had a bit of a skin problem? And I think that's... A, there, there you can see that kind of... Looks like the same kind of skin trouble that that one Birmingham male had. That seems to be fine. I'm sure it'll probably spread a little bit like that male's did, but then that male's skin disease did go away. Ah, oh, there we are. And the one is, one is tempted to say, well, you know, you know, while the, the plebeians struggle to get a view of our wonderful sighting, we sit here like Lord, Lord Brian Muck and Lord Jim Muck, perfectly perched alone viewing our lions. Ah, now, Jesse, you are perhaps a, a cat owner yourself. You say, do lions have scratching posts like domestic cats do? They do, actually. 
I'm not sure to keep those claws short so much as to keep them sharp. And they've got trees. They use trees all the time. And we found one. In fact, I found two on the last two walks I did. I think both with Brian, we found where lions had been scratching on a tree. And you can definitely see where those razor-like, sharp, long claws have torn the bark off. They do that a lot. If you see them just getting moving, they will often, often leap up into a tree and scratch away at the bark. Oh, look at that. So very difficult, of course, to try and um, identify the difference between these two. You can do it. If you see the whisker marks there, if you are able to take a picture and count them, then you can tell them one from the other. But of course, if you're just looking at them like we're looking at them, it's almost impossible. Uh, now, Lillian, this is an astute question you've asked because you haven't asked why it is that she isn't attacking us. You've asked why she is not afraid of us. You're a new viewer. It's lovely to have you with us. Please try and tell us where you're from next time you ask a question. It's always so nice to know. Um, and Sorry, the radio again has gone crazy in my ear. Let me just gather my thoughts, Lillian. Lillian, you say, why is she not afraid of the human presence? It's because she doesn't, I don't want to say she doesn't know that we're human, but she doesn't perceive us as a threat. We're not on foot. If we got out of the car, Lillian, she would almost certainly go from what she is now, relaxed and lying in the cool sand, to viciously terrifying. Because she's got cubs here, she wouldn't be able to move away, she'd feel cornered and she'd almost certainly charge. Because we're in a vehicle and we don't exactly know why it is that lions don't and all the animals don't react to us in the same way in the vehicle. They've got good eyes, they've got good noses, they certainly smell human being when they're around cars, but they don't perceive us in the same way. They don't perceive us as a threat in the vehicles. And it's very, very interesting because as a friend of mine said to me once, he said, you know, a lion or a leopard is able to spot a monkey uh, by its ear. You know, at sort of 200 meters, it'll see a monkey's ear behind a tree. You can't tell me that when they look at our faces, they don't know that we're human beings or don't recognize us for human beings. But because we're not bipedal, we're in these big vehicles, they don't associate us with a threat. And I think that's why she's not afraid of us. some elephants shouting, possibly at Buffersook Dam, which is not far from here. Michael, you're interested in those spots again, and they are very interesting. You say, when will they disappear? Um, Michael, they'll start to fade round about now, those obvious spots. They'll start to fade as they start to move with the pride. And by about a year old, they'll be gone. But like you say, some of them do retain them, especially on the underside of the legs. Now, Brian, if you don't mind, if you just tilt up a little, you'll see the lioness's back leg there still retains some of that spotting. So some of them retain it into adulthood. Some have almost no spots in adulthood. But the ones on the head will almost certainly disappear by the time they're a year old. Maybe even before. <laughs> I think that one's fallen asleep on the boob, as it were. quite interesting. I've just heard on the radio Aubrey saying that there are a lot of vultures not too far from here and I wonder if she didn't kill something there or there might be the rest of the pride there. 
That would be fascinating. He's going to go and have a look on foot, Aubrey. <laughs> I was reading a tragic story today about a kid who committed suicide, unfortunately, because of bullying at school. And Debbie, it's obviously a very serious problem amongst all mammal species. You say, did uh, will, will these cubs experience bullying from the older cubs in the pride? Absolutely, they will. Completely. And sometimes, you know, if there are, say, say there are eight or nine bigger cubs within a pride, when much younger cubs join the pride, say they're three or four months younger, sometimes they can be outcompeted completely and they'll die. So, yes, bullying absolutely takes place. It seems to be a fairly universal mammal trait, actually. It happens in the elephants. Except in the elephants, the mothers don't tolerate it. They will bash any of the bulls who try and bully the other ones. And But it definitely happens, and especially amongst uh, male cubs and male mammals generally, as they try and exert some form of sort of testosterone fuel dominance. There often is this kind of a bullying situation. It's an unattractive trait of mammals. There, Brian, that's a female there. Go down a little, that's it. So we've got one female at least. The other one, oh, can't really tell there. Hang on a second there. Let's have a look. You can get closer with the camera there, Brian. Is that is that as close in there as you can get? Please excuse this shot, everyone. I think that's a female as well. I think that's two girls. What do you think, Brian? That's definitely a female. Yeah, I'm not so sure either. Yeah, in fact, no, hang on. That's the bottom there that we can see. So that's um, that's a male. That's definitely the beginnings of uh, his scrotum. So that's a male. So we've got one male, one female. Brilliant stuff. The other one, I'm not so sure. Obviously, can't tell from the face. <laughs> I know Jean in North Carolina, you've made a particularly good observation and one that I have failed to pick up. You say, all oh, these cubs have got black noses and not pink noses. Gene, they will get pink noses, almost certainly. I mean, if you see them, if you look at the mother's nose, for example, it's pink. She's quite a young one, I think. That tells, no, we're all youngish. It tells me that she's probably about mm, three years old, three and a half years old or so. Um, and lions, normally, by the time they're six, their noses are completely black. But, yeah, these ones seem to have been born with black noses. <laughs> I'm just slightly distressed, Gene, that I have obviously never noticed that before. It's bizarre. Let me just quickly check my camera here. Yes, they most certainly are black noses, aren't they? Black noses indeed, Gene. Now, everybody, we're going to sit here for a little bit longer, but while we wait and see what transpires at this unbelievable sighting, Jamie is with another mother, the Great Queen. Enjoy. The Great Queen indeed, and she is on the move. I'm sorry for my extended absence, but I had to come racing through from Arethusa all the way to the other side of Juma to follow up on our lovely female leopard, Karula. I'm just trying to figure out where she's going to go. She's taken us into a really tricky position, into a drainage system that runs close to Gauri, Maine. So we're going to try and get... Pardon? 
past one of the other vehicles and then have a look at her from the other side. Hello, everybody. And there she's off. And she was sitting very regally on the top of the log. No cubs with her that we can see. It looks as though she's on the hunt, looking for something to catch. Alert and on the move. Brent for Jamie. You gonna go ahead? Thanks, Bernie. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Brent, Brent, I'm just trying to get him here onto this side so that he can help us keep track of her because I can't cross this drainage system. Oh, watch out there, Viam. Poor Viam's been playing Dodge the Branch. We've got to really hope she stays on this side. So wonderful to see Karula after an extended period of absence. Two leopards in one afternoon. It's not a bad way to continue one's afternoon. She's seen something. She's seen something. Hold on. There she goes. Let's just get around the other side of the termite mound. spotted something. We're going to have to stop the vehicle here. There she goes. She's just dived into the drainage system. Let's just wait and see. We'll have to listen now. Where did she go? Almost certain that she was hunting something, or she's decided to duck into the drainage system. I'm trying to get a hold of Brent to tell him to go to the other side of it because we can't get around it. And hopefully, he'll be able to help us out there. Come on, Karula. It's very thick here. And obviously we want to be very, very careful, which is why I stopped there for a moment, just to listen, to make sure that we don't have any impact on her hunt. Either for her or for the prey animals. You okay there, Vian? moved in through here. You got her? Yeah, right across. Right. Oh yes, there she is. Okay, so she's moved across onto the other side of the drainage system. Awesome, well spotted via. So she's ducking, she's getting closer and closer to whatever it is she's looking for. And welcome back to Rachel. This is Rachel's very first time seeing the Queen of Juma. Well, Rachel, I hope that we manage to get her uh, from, uh, in her full glory. We're going to have to be really careful here, Rachel. Look at her body language. That stealth that a leopard is absolutely famous for. She's hunting something on the other side of this drainage system. And I don't know what it is I can't see, but I'm just going to wait and listen because we don't want to have a negative impact on what's going on. She's going forward back towards Gowrie Main. Brent, Brent, Brent for Jamie. Brent is out on tracking team to help us out. Have you got her there, Vim? She's there. I 
And now, unfortunately, we're just going to have to wait here. She's hunting there. She's hunting, she's stalking something that side. Yeah, straight through there, towards Gary Main. Yeah. <laughs> you got her? Well done. They managed to spot her for us. We've got her still. Okay. Hi, guys. Sorry, guys. We're just going to get past here. You got her again? Yep. Okay, let's go back a bit. I'm just going to wait for the vehicles to move around to the other side. Just listen to the alarm calls. Here's some Franklin. The Franklins have picked up on her. Thanks, Benny. It looks like last visual she was going straight towards Gary Main. There go the uh, there go the Franklins. And that is the end of her hunt. Her hunt has been definitely halted by the alarm calls of the Franklins, so immediately the Inyala on edge looking to see what's upset them. As you can see, driving through here would be suicide. And Doodles raises a good point, which I think has been a concern for some people, understandably, which is that Doodles would be nervous driving around in the bush with all of the small cubs because they are so camouflaged. And that is, you raise a very, very important point that we should actually address. And that is, first of all, we're exceptionally careful where we drive. And second of all, I wonder if we can get around this side. I don't think so. You think there's a spot, Vim? From a year back. <laughs> Vim thinks he remembers a spot from a year back. Here we go. Let's give it a go. Um, so Doodles raises a good point. The leopard cubs are in no way under threat from the movement of our vehicles. And the reason I say that is because at this point, first of all, we know they're not here because we would have seen their tracks somewhere. But let's, let's say we didn't. Let's say we missed something. The leopard cubs would be out and gone faster than you could say boo to them. They'd already be out of our way. There we go. VM's right, you know. VM is spot on. Copy, thanks, Bernie. She's going straight towards Gowrie, Maine. You okay there, Viam? Sorry, everyone. Oh, no, don't cross south, Karula. Dodge the trees that we can't drive over. And welcome to Megan Gaines. Lovely to have you on board. Megan says this is her first time watching and she is so excited. I am too, Megan. I'm excited and also desperately trying to get you this. This is going to hurt. This is going to hurt. This is ah. <laughs> desperate to get you this leopard once again. So we're very careful in terms of where we drive, Doodles. Um, there's been, I've never heard of people driving over lion cubs unless they are doing something completely ridiculous, which I mean has never happened here in the Sabi sand as far as I know. And then to Megan, yes, it's exciting. Let's get, there's the road, that's what I'm looking for. There's an old hyena den here. Oh, you're still on board, Viam? Amazing. Not quite sure how. Stand by. 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 Stand by.
standing by. She's just crossed into the Bulgari. Um, there were three of us. Unfortunately, everybody, it seems as though Karula, like Tingana, wasn't planning on playing ball with us today. And he has decided to cross into Little Gowrie. Let's see if we can't get one last view of her. And now there's lots of different vehicles. We're just going to stop here and let one of them come out. Oh, my apologies to Megan and to Rachel, for whom this was the first time meeting the Queen of Juma. Thanks. Thank you. Let's just see if we can't get one last view. She might come back. Let's look for her. Apparently she was still visible. Let's just look carefully. How's it guys? Good thanks, how are you? Uh, can you guys, do you know where she is? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Cheers, thank you. Tracks going across. Let's just sit here. She might not be gone for good. I can hear the babbler's alarm calling at her. They're going... Okay, I can see exactly where she may be. Do you see in there, Viam, they the marula tree with the babblers. Oh, with the wood hoopers as well. I think they're alarm calling at her. That's exactly where she disappeared. Let's not go anywhere just yet. Let's not count our chickens before they've hatched or count the leopards that left their property before they've left. She might come back to us. Come on, Karula. Crossing to Belisic from Chilakap Lane. Come back and say goodbye. This is, I think, my last drive of this work cycle. I think I'm on leave tomorrow. It depends, though. I'm not entirely sure if I've got the morning off or not, so I may or may not be on the Sunrise Safari. But it would be nice to have a Karula sighting. Or it has been nice to have a Karula sighting to say goodbye for now. For now. You got it? Well done, Vim. Oh, there, are they mobbing her? I think they are, you know. Let's try reposition, wait, where, let me just try and, try and work out exactly where that is. Yeah, I think she's being mobbed by the wood hoopoos, which is relatively unusual. You don't often see them frantically trying to... Amazing. That's a new one for me. I don't think I've ever seen a wood hoopoo bomb a leopard. Okay, I've memorized where she is. Let's try repositioning a little bit. She's just behind that termite mound. Yeah, that one there. And as it starts to get dark, the sun going down, James, of course, will have to leave that magical lion cub sighting in a moment. So let's head across to him so that you can say goodbye to them. Goodbye. Brian, say goodbye. Bye. We're being facetious, everybody. We can sit here for a few more minutes and then we'll... <laughs> Sometimes I find myself so amusing, Brian. Yes. <laughs> um, 
We can sit here for a few more minutes. We just don't want to be after dark, everyone. And the sun's just dipped below the western horizon there. It will still be up in some parts, but because we're down here in the drainage line, it's going to be quite difficult to get out of here. Ah, it's interesting. Okay, this is quite interesting. So, I'm just listening to the radio. Aubrey has said that he did find a kudu that had been finished by lions uh, not too far from here. I've no doubt that she, she, I doubt she ate it on her own, but she was probably with the pride. So, Monique in London, you know that uh, you, well, you asked whether she was eating or not. I think she probably helped to finish that kudu. And we had another question about whether or not she'll hunt with the pride at the moment and the answer is yes absolutely sometimes and clearly last night I suspect if it was a kudu I think it's probably highly likely that that kudu um, was killed by the pride <laughs> that is just too spectacular for words <laughs> I will have to take another photograph even though I've taken 786 photographs today most of which are completely unusable. I'll take another one. Hello, Fiona. You say, do I think that lions dream? Um, I do, Fiona. I've seen them, you know, like do when dogs dream and they chase things in their dreams. And some, some of them, we had a little dog called Trub Short one stage, God rest his soul, um, who used to go, yip, 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 in his dreams. And... I think I've never heard a lion sort of growling in their sleep, but I've certainly seen them um, shaking a little and a little bit of uh, growling or uh, sort of um, movement that indicates to me that, yes, they do, in fact, dream. What they dream about, Brian, I couldn't tell you. Meat, probably, most of the time. Meat and running. Meat and running and sleeping. They may even dream of sleeping. They do so much sleeping, they probably dream about sleeping. <laughs> okay, everybody, it's getting a little bit dark now. And so I just, I think it, because we're going to have to make quite a lot of noise to get out of here, I think we're going to have to call this quits. Thank you for joining us at the Lions. It's been, well, it's been okay, hasn't it, Brian? It's been quite nice, yes, we are very good. Okay, we'll get out of here. We're, of course, being completely sarcastic. It's been an unbelievably wonderful afternoon here with these little lions. We'll make our way out to Bifflesook Dam, and we'll probably catch up with you there. So until then, see you then. Till then, see you then. Wonderful. It's wonderful. Sounds to me that that lion sighting was more than quite nice. It was quite lovely. In the meantime, our leopards are playing games with us this afternoon. How's that tire looking on the front left there, Viam? Yeah, fine. fine. Amazing. That is quite remarkable considering the number of zebra woods that we just drove over. So perhaps we'll awaken to a nice flat tire at some point. I'm just triple checking that she hasn't decided to come back north. And welcome to Elissa, who is 11 years old from New York. It is so lovely to have you on board with us. Now, Elissa would like to know if we live in this park. And yes, we are that lucky that we get to live in the game reserves that we work in. Now, what happens is because the nearest sort of city or town is actually really far away, we w and we start really, really early in the morning, before sunrise each and every day, um, we wouldn't be able to get here in time to start our job. So almost everybody who works in on a game reserve, whether it's a hospitality manager, maybe working reception or giving massages to the guests or cooking for the guests, or in our case, driving guests around, although what we do is slightly different, then yes, we live on the game reserve itself and we spend a considerable period of time here. And what usually happens, Alyssa, is we have a six-week work cycle where we work every day, including weekends, um, and usually twice a day. So you work, you work all day, public holidays, national holidays, weekends as well. And then in return, you actually get a two-week holiday every six weeks in order to just get people out so that we don't get cabin fever and start to feel like we're going a little bit crazy, which does happen every now and again. 
So that's the way we work. It's very different to most normal jobs. So we all live together, we all work together, and we all socialize together, which means we're very close. It's kind of like a family. It's almost exactly like a family, working with a team like this. Whew, things starting to wind down. I'm going to make my way back towards the western boundary of Juma to see whether or not perhaps the Birmingham boys might decide to come and pay us a visit towards the end of the sunset safari. Now the sun is absolutely glorious this afternoon, or this evening. Unfortunately, let me try and get it so that we get rid of the poles. Yes, there we go. Never mind, vm has got it. He's done it. Since it has been such a glorious afternoon, let us just sit and enjoy. Actually, for me, my last sunset in the bush for now, because as I answered Alyssa's question, I'm going on my two-week break, vacation, and I will be back at the end of that, towards the end of August. Beautiful. And here in Australia, as we watch the sun go down, and I hope, against hope, that Karula might decide to pop back onto the road. Pierre in Australia would like to know what do we do we have a favorite time to present? I have a favorite time to be out in the bush. I don't know if I would necessarily if that equates to my favorite time to present. Oh, I've got sunspots in front of my eyes. I'm trying to look for Karula at the same time. Pierre, my favorite, my personal favorite time is first thing in the morning as the sun is coming up. Just that moment before dawn, that pre-dawn light is my favorite time to be out and about in the bush at night. Or oh, sorry, early in the morning. My second favorite time is this time of evening. You've got this excitement building as the sun starts to go down. You know that the big cats are going to start getting up and moving about. The leopards, the lions, and the hyenas as well. And all of the smaller and more serious creatures. So it's, this is my second favorite time of day. But that, of course, is why we do a sunrise and a sunset safari. It's the two best times to be out in the bush. And you definitely really don't want to be doing a noontime safari in midsummer with temperatures over... 40, 45, and I mean, Pierre, you're from Australia, so I'm sure you'll understand what that's like. You will have experienced it in your time. Definitely not something one wants to endure, and actually not something our equipment can endure. And you won't see anything. It'll all be, everything will be fast asleep or hiding in the shade. We're just going to slowly cruise our way back towards the western boundary. And talking of our holiday time, Liz, you want to know whether or not we would use our holiday time to perhaps travel different parts of Africa or what exactly it is that we would do. Now this particular holiday time I'm probably going to go back to Johannesburg just to go and visit my family. You kind of got to weigh up your different your time and your holidays and financially as well in terms of what where you can go and how long you can go for. Um, ideally I would love to go traveling throughout Africa and that is what we do occasionally if we can. The last holiday we did Brent and I went all the way down to the south coast in South Africa we have been trying to plan a, perhaps a trip to Botswana at some point or Namibia, but those are all up in the air. But yes, you, absolutely, you can go to other parts of Africa, can and do go to other parts of Africa. It's just a matter of trying to divide your time because, of course, we spend long, long weeks and months away from our families, so we have to go back and touch base every now and again. And that is what I will be doing. But never fear, Brent and James will still be here to keep you thoroughly 100% entertained.
One thing that feels very strange about this afternoon sunset safari is we have not seen one elephant, which I'm quite disappointed by. Inting sound coming from underneath the vehicle, isn't there, Viam? The exhaust might be loose. There is a sort of a gentle rattling. I think that's exactly what's happened. I think we've knocked the exhaust loose in our frantic off-roading for Karula. And to Sarah in Cape Town on the subject of hyena coming out at night. Sarah, we used to see them pretty much every day. We had an active den site with little cubs. We'd go and we'd visit at least once a day. They'd come barreling out, falling over each other. They were absolutely, are absolutely adorable. But unfortunately what they've done is they've decided to move their den site outside of our traverse area because of course whilst we have boundaries, I can go on my right hand side but I can't go into the land on my left hand side because that would be into Little Gauri. The animals have no such boundaries and would probably laugh at the thought of our boundaries, although of course they have territories themselves. So we can't get there. The last time I saw a hyena was yesterday afternoon on the sunset safari I believe. Wait. No, I wasn't driving yesterday afternoon on the Sunset Safari, was I? The afternoon before that on the Sunset Safari with Viam, and we had Tingana up in a tree with a kill and a hyena lying down underneath it, patiently waiting for its opportunity to snatch up the scraps. I think that was the last time I saw a hyena. Lots of tracks every single day, so whilst our hyenas have moved their home, they have not moved away from Juma. They're still around. They're still up and down each and every night. We hear them occasionally. Hello, Mbala. A lovely herd. And of course for them, I don't suppose they feel the same excitement we do as the sun starts to go down. Must be a bit of a nerve-wracking time. There's our little males. Can you believe? These are the same young males that we watched with their wobbly legs taking their first steps around December. They've now got dagger-like horns on the top of their head. Not quite as impressive as a fully grown four-year-old Impala ram, but impressive when you think how we've watched them change over the months. From the tiniest little spikes sticking out of the top of their head, to now have sporting what I'm sure they feel is an impressive set of horns. Not just yet though. And the female lambs are now fully grown, almost indistinguishable from the adults themselves. This year's crop of impala lambs are now all grown up. And once again the females, now that the mating season is over, almost all of them will now be pregnant. Unless they are the little ones. I'm trying to see what they're up to. I'm going to roll back, I think, because there's a nice group here. Unless they are last year's babies, they will, the females will mostly be pregnant. So there's about a 95% pregnancy rate of adult females. And of course, not all of those lambs will survive. In fact, a huge amount of them won't. But it's one of the reasons that impala are so successful as a species in terms of keeping their number up since Everything wants to eat an impala, except perhaps an adult male lion who might not be bothered. But pretty much every predator wants to eat an impala. Somebody just did a little kick. And they keep their numbers up by having incredibly successful breeding strategies. I just want to see... I'm hoping he's going to walk out into the open. I'm sure I just saw an impala with a white spot on his bottom. I'm going to try and work out what it is. Where's he gone now? <laughs> They're all nibbling away, enjoying the last of their dinner. They are beautiful antelope. There he is on the left hand side of your screen. He's hidden now behind the branch, but just have a look at the... there. He's got something white on him. Huh. 
I don't know what that is, except perhaps some oxpecker feces. Hmm. Which is actually, now that I think about it, you don't often see oxpeckers defecate on the animals they sit on. I don't think I've ever seen them do it. I suppose that makes sense. Their hosts wouldn't be terribly tolerant of them if part of the deal involved being defecated on on a regular basis, particularly if you're a buffalo and you've got, you know, ten oxpeckers sitting on your back. Oxpeckers, by the way, are birds, for those of you who are new to the safari, the type of bird that sifts through the animal's fur and picks off all the ticks and parasites. Never thought about that before. But I really, I don't think I've ever seen an oxpecker defecate on its host. Hmm. Guess it makes sense. We're going to go and search for the male lions. Let's jump over onto the back of James's vehicle and find out how things are working or think what things are happening at Buffles Hook Dam. We've just gone past Buffles Hook Dam, everybody, where there was a, seemed to be a, um, there seemed to be a drinks party going on, so we left there. We didn't hang about, and we've now left. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly get on the radio again. Sorry, go again with that. Yeah, no, it's absolutely fine. Uh, they just mustn't have a, a light on them, so it's fine as long as you can see them, no problem. So they were just asking there about whether or not they can um, be in the sighting with the sun down, and that's fine now, as long as there isn't any artificial light on them, so that's fine. So we got out of that sighting, everyone, found that the road was uh, substantially closer than the route we'd taken in. And I mean, we came in, we came in through a drainage line over about 70,000 trees. Well, we were attacked by a number of bears on our way in, and we found that the uh, that the route was actually very easy. Uh, so if we go back in there tomorrow morning, uh, it will be a lot easier than it was this afternoon. Now I'm going to make my way onto the Biffleshook cut line, from whence we can see the last embers of the day over the Drakensberg. Hello, Greg. You say, um, why do we wear clothes that match the landscape? Uh, are we trying to be stealthy? This is safari guides. Uh, safari guides dress largely for fashion, uh, Greg. Now, they'll tell you they're doing it to, to stay stealthy and to stay out of the way of, uh, so that animals don't see them and that sort of thing. Uh, but basically, it's become tradition that you wear khaki or green like I'm wearing or sometimes um, a grey colour. And yes, if you're on foot, it makes a difference because it means that the light doesn't reflect so much. Now, this is quite a good colour, but a lot of the khaki that safari guides wear is actually actually uh, pretty obvious to animals because it's quite light and that light color tends to reflect light. So yes, I, I mean the tradition is that you try and wear something that makes you a little bit camouflaged out here but it does become largely fashionable because if you came to a safari lodge and you find your, found your guide in a bright red shirt and uh, orange pants I don't think you'd think very much of his skills. But in actual fact, sitting in the vehicle here, you could be dressed in just about anything you like, and it would make no difference at all to the animals. On foot, it's a bit different, uh, but white and black are the two things, the, the two colors. If you look around here, you won't see any white, and you won't see any black, completely white or completely black, and so those are actually the two most real, really obvious colors, other than sort of, I suppose, bright orange you might find quite easily, but you, you find orange in the leaves, you find orange in the flowers, you find red in the leaves and the flowers, so white and black really are the two colors you want to try and avoid if you're out here on a walking safari. If you're in the vehicle, it doesn't really make a huge difference. <laughs> I'm always, I mean I've told this story before, but Greg, if you ever come on safari, um, and you go to these safari lodges or into the Kruger and you drive yourself. You'll find people who take safari outfitting very seriously indeed. Um, and you'll find them dressed in all sorts of um, um, 
or shall we say kit that a salesman has been very clever about getting rid of so you'll find families and matching safari gear uh, sometimes uh, we've had people on safari that have these sort of pith helmets that have beekeeping nets over the top of them because somebody's told them that it's very dangerous for them to be in Africa that there are mosquitoes and all sorts of biting flies that will savage them unless every piece of their skin is covered that's always quite amusing to watch and then people come on safari in boots that you could probably hike Everest quite successfully in and of course a pair of slip slops if you're on a safari like this will be perfectly adequate and as I've said also many times before, the most important thing that you can possibly ever bring on safari is a good pair of binoculars. So if you ever come on safari, Greg, don't worry about the kit that you need. Uh, a good pair of binoculars is going to immeasurably improve your safari. Now we're going to go sort of in towards the center of the property. I know the Karula's crossed out again, uh, but maybe there will be some other kind of le leopard activity, or maybe the rest of the pride. Brent is over around there, and I think he's looking for the rest of the pride now. <laughs> Abra, good question. You say if you come to the Kruger and you drive your own vehicle, you're not allowed to keep your window open and yet here we are driving around exposed in an open convertible and can I explain how, why that is? Um, it's explicable because, uh, well, I'm trained to be here. All the guides around here are trained. In the Kruger National Park, of course, anyone can drive in and so they err on the side of caution where you're not allowed to get out of the car. You can drive with your window down, that's fine. You're allowed to drive with your window down, but you can't. And um, the idea is that if you see an animal like a lion or something, you wind your window up. It actually doesn't make a huge difference. But because anyone can go in there, um, you've got to err on the side of caution. If everybody behaved themselves and everybody drove around in a vehicle like this and they didn't stand up and they didn't get out of the car and they didn't make a noise and they could read animal behavior correctly and make sure that they didn't um, behave, uh, you know, they didn't behave badly. Sorry, I'm just listening to Brent. Um, what you'll find is that, uh, you know, then it would be fine. But because people are unable to behave themselves and people are not trained, they don't understand animal behavior and why should they? you'd find that they'd probably antagonize animals and there would be accidents. So that's why. But you could easily drive into the Kruger National Park in an open vehicle like this and you'd be in no more danger than we are here right now. Let me put some lights on. There we are, Brian. Immeasurable, immeasurable difference to our sight. Yes. I'm just going to call Brent on the radio. Brent, come in. You'll be able to hear him speaking. Brent, can you go again with that last message, please? My microphone is in my head, everybody. There's lion contact calls in the block between the other and south back near the town, closer to the north. Okay, copy. I'm coming down central. I'll drive near the road south. So he says there, you heard him there saying there are lion contact calls on Nyala Road South. That's not too far from where we are now. It's not too far from where Aubrey had um, found the kudu carcass, which I'm sure was eaten by the lionesses of the Nkuhuma Pride last night. While we see if we can get in there and see if we can find something, let's go to Jamie and get an update from her. We are on the western boundary of Juma between Arethusa and Juma. And unfortunately, there is a little bit of a lineup now for all those lions in terms of people wanting to go and see them. And I don't want to take that opportunity away from them since they haven't had lions on that er in that area for a really long time. So their guests haven't had a chance to listen to the amazing experience that we enjoyed two days ago with a male lion roaring right next to the vehicle. So we're just calmly lurking, basically. We are lurking on the western boundary because if the lions do decide to come across in this direction then we'll be able to follow them and stick with them if they carry on to the east and they probably will a good chance they're going to start heading back towards their lady friends that's our plan for the last few moments of the sunset safari 
And if it doesn't, um, if it doesn't happen, then that's okay too. There's plenty of nocturnal creatures to hopefully keep us occupied. And it's a really beautiful, balmy winter's evening. It's really, truly lovely out here. Now, Sarah's asked an interesting question. She's a new viewer, and it's lovely to have you on board, Sarah. Now, Sarah's wondering about what would happen in a situation if an untamed lion came up right up to the vehicle. What would be our first response? Um, none of our lions are actually tamed, but I know, what, I know what you're saying. If an unhabituated lion, a lion that's not, worth, not used to vehicles, it's a tricky one. A lion that is not used to vehicles is going to run away. If it approaches you, in a situation, it's probably habituated, and then it's probably, if it does approach you, it's probably habituated, it's probably okay. In a very, very unusual situation where, for some reason, you've got, maybe it's a, a weakened lion that's looking at you as if you might be something edible, and I'm talking, this is, your chances of this happening is probably less than a plane crash, if not even more, I mean, really, it's hugely, hugely unlikely. I think my first response, if I had an aggressive lion response to my vehicle or to my passengers on my vehicle, would be to probably make a noise that that animal's not familiar with and then gauge its reaction from there. So it would be a whack on the side of the door or even a metallic tap, just tapping my fingernails on the side of the door. And then I'd gauge my response from there. I'd probably be aiming to get out of there as quickly as possible. If it's showing signs, it would be such an unusual response, such a rare incident, that I think my response would probably be to try and get us out of it and into safety. And even with all of the power of acceleration of our vehicle, we'd have to have a good head start to do so. Now, an interesting question. It's not something, fortunately, I've ever, ever had to deal with. As I said, it's hugely unlikely. Our even walking during the day, walking. Uh, are we going to manage this? Hello, little Dacre. Oh. <laughs> I think this is the male that we had the other morning on the sunrise safari. Oh, no, it's not. His horns are a little bit too big. A lovely male Dacre. And what's nice as a comparison here is if you have a look at his horns, in the females and the young males, they have a mohawk of hair that grows up from the center of their head, meant to imitate horns. In the adult males, with the long horns, they don't have that anymore. It's completely disappeared. And that tells us almost instantly exactly why they have that mohawk. Because then it's clearly, clearly to act as a, a mock horn to deter predators. It doesn't really work. But it is a very interesting physiological adaptation, or adaption is actually the word. Oh, nibbling away, enjoying the last of his dinner. So an interesting little observation, the same applies to warthog. Baby warthog have incredibly fluffy cheeks. They've got white fur that extends out on the side of their faces. And that, again, is meant to fool animals into thinking that they're more dangerous than they actually are. The same goes for the pearl-spotted owlet with his eyes on the back of his head. Fake eyes on the back of his head. Also meant to be an intimidation factor. And it's fascinating that all of these animals have evolved these funny little methods of looking scarier than they actually are or bigger than they actually are. And yet it doesn't really work in terms of intimidating predators. It might intimidate another male, definitely, or a rival. But intimidating predators doesn't really work. Now, it's an interesting evolutionary battle between the different techniques of prey versus predators. I was talking about lions on foot, lions on foot during the day, absolutely fine. They have thousands of years of evolution telling them that we are the hunters and they are the prey. Lions at night, totally different experience. And you want to be home and safe and not on foot as it starts to get dark. Let's go across to James talking about it getting dark and find out what his plans are for the evening.
My plans for the evening, everybody, are to go and, you know, have a fine, uh, a fine dinner somewhere, probably at a restaurant. Uh, what do you think, Brian? Um, possibly on the King's Road. Ooh, yes, yeah, that'll be very nice. After which we'll go to a gentle, a gentle. Um, what else can we do this evening, Brian? After we've had our dinner, maybe a pleasant, a pleasant pub with leather seats and cigars. Oh, yes. yes. I'm obviously being totally ridiculous, everybody. Captain Tampa, you want to know if there's a fireside chat today? There is not. We're not having a fireside chat this evening. Um, I'm not sure when the next one will be, probably next week. It just depends. It's a fairly random arrangement. It depends on how much is going on and how much time we have to put together the clips and that sort of thing. So no fireside chat today, Cat. Just a few more minutes left of this incredible drive we've had. A very, very special Sunday afternoon. Now we just came down here. Brent said that you, I mean, I, you, you heard him say that he heard Lions contact calling somewhere around here. We haven't picked anything up. I think they're probably further off towards the east there in some thick block. Some thick bush. We're not going to try and find them now unless they come up onto the road. Ah, right. Now, Andrew, while you've asked your question, over there is a red impala. You say, why are there no animals with green fur? I think for a few reasons. First of all, that color, although it's very obvious to us, as Brian pointed out to me, is not obvious to an animal that sees not in color. Because the animals out here that are colorblind see Brian in... So they see in greens and blues, and that red color is very difficult to see then. So although obvious to us that green and red juxtaposed against itself um, or against each other is very easy for our eyes to see, for the predators which see in greens and blues, that isn't easy to see. So that's one of the reasons. One of the other reasons is that the green pigment is actually, I think, it's very, very seldom found in nature but for in plants. You find it in birds, but only a few birds have got actual green pigment. So um, the luris, the taracos, uh, they are one of the only birds that has, in fact, they may be the only bird that has a green pigment. The rest of them combine blue and yellow to make green, or they have special reflective chambers in amongst various crystals of, I think, melanin, and uh, what's the keratin and they it reflects green light but there is no green pigment so green pigment is actually extremely rare and so that's two reasons why animals don't have green fur i think it'd be almost impossible for them to make that green fur but that color that that impala is is actually a lot more camouflage than you would think it is if you happen to be a predator that only sees in greens and blues all righty on we go no, Rusty. There's no need to make a roaring noise like that. Now, we're on Twin Dams Road and wondering if those lions might pop out here. But perhaps one or two. Oh, there's a lovely call, Brian. Listen to that. Come on, do it, bird. There we are. And those of you, I know we've had a few people from Johannesburg watching today, Brian and Hannah, just two of you. And you, of course, will be well familiar with the call of the Hardy Dar, which Brian is going to do for you now. Brian? There we go. That is the call of the Hardy Dar, <laughs> which you will hear if you live in Johannesburg very early in the morning. Not a very pleasant sound if it happens to be a Saturday or Sunday after a heavy night out. <laughs> very nice. Kirsten, sorry, I missed your last communication. Brian was calling like a hardy dog. <laughs> Brian, that was excellent. Well done. Good job. You do try and you succeed. More often than not, I think there's some people up ahead. Just turn the lights off in case they think that they're on the stage. 
They're having their sundowners. If you ever come to Africa, everyone, a sundowner at sunset, a very, very pleasant way to while away the evening hours. Not so, Brian? Good evening. Yeah, smile for the TV, everybody. You're now famous. They, of course, now think I'm a total idiot. They're probably not wrong. <laughs> they come from Jakarta, or Jacobin, sorry, which is just next to Nkoro, just north of Cheetah Plains, where we spend much time, as you know. And the six little Styx lionesses with their, not six little lionesses, they're eight little lion cubs of the Styx pride with their, nice that they're still alive. They were looking a little bit ropey a little while back. All right, everyone, that's going to be it from Brian, Tumbleweed, and I. We're going to say goodbye to you. We'll see you tomorrow at uh, Wells, six o'clock in the morning, hopefully with some more lions and leopards. Until then, stay safe and happy, and thank you for all your questions and comments today. It's been a joy to share those lions and their cubs with you. Bye-bye. And so another beautiful evening or afternoon draws to a close and it's time for us to head for home and as James always points out the smell of Amanda's cooking wafting across Juma is definitely an attractive prospect to all of us involved and we'll be heading back home waiting for the mysteries of the night to sort of unfold themselves and we'll have to go and explore tomorrow. And oh, Gracie, that's a lovely message that has come through from you. Now, Gracie is eight years old. Gracie, I'll miss you too, and I'll miss all of your amazing questions. And I promise you that I will have an amazing time and come back with lots of different stories to tell you, lots of exciting stories to tell you. But thank you for that. That made my day and definitely put a smile on my face for this evening. A lovely message coming through from one very special little lady. First thing I'm going to do is eat some takeaway Chinese food and then maybe some sushi. Sushi is definitely not something that you get out here in the bush, at least not sushi that you should trust. It's a bit of a risky business that. Oh, I'm just going to drop my lights as we come through here. And Wendy's got a whole variety of light switches. There's lots and lots of kudu and impala standing off in the darkness. And at this point, we don't put any lights on them, just so that we don't interfere with their night vision. Just like if I were to shine a torch in your eyes, you'd find yourself blinking away purple spots. And the same thing, not quite so pronounced, because, of course, they're, more, they're better at seeing in the dark. They've got a more reflective layer. But that's basically what shining spotlights on diurnal animals does to them, so we don't do it is not to make them more vulnerable to any of the predators moving about out here. And perhaps I'll go on a, well, depends on if I'm off tomorrow morning or not, but I might go on a tracking team. Pleasure, Donna. Donna would like me to do a hardy dar impression. So for Donna in the last minute, wah, 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 wah. Because, you know, hardy dars are really afraid of heights, which is why they screech all the time when they fly. Ah! That's what I was always taught, and it still makes me giggle to this day. Right, and on that absurd note, it has come time for us to say a big farewell. So thank you to Viam for his fantastic camera work, as well as to Kirsty and to Jerry in Final Control. And most of all, a very big thank you to all of you joining us across the globe. It's, and I'm thanking you for not just tonight and this afternoon sunset safari, but also for the past seven or so weeks that I've had the pleasure of your company. And I look forward to seeing you again in two weeks' time. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. I'll miss you all in the bush, and I'll see you again very soon. Bye-bye, everybody.